Hello, everyone. Uh, good day. My name is Rob Romanchuk, and I'll give you a little bit of background on me so you know where I come from. I've been in the clinical trial arena for about 20 years. Started as a clinical research coordinator, then I spent a couple of years as an IRB manager for a, a large community hospital. Then I spent about 15 years building a central research in infrastructure for a 14 hospital community health system. During that time, I also continued working on the IRB side by working as a consultant performing IRB site visits for central IRBs. And I have to say that was probably the most educational experience I had in clinical research because I got to see clinical research being done in about every imaginable setting. More recently, I've been with a commercial IRB for about four years as a chairperson. So I'm kind of one of those strange animals that walks on both sides of the fence in the research arena, both in research operations and in human subjects protections. I think it gives me kind of a unique perspective because I tend to look at things as a research manager when I'm in an IRB meeting, and I tend to look at matters from the IRB perspective when, in, when I'm in a research setting. So I hope you'll find that useful. So as far as our learning objectives today are, we're going to appraise the breadth and the depth of the revised common rule try to distinguish the individual changes to each clinical research professional's role in the research enterprise. I believe we have quite a varied group with us today, so I'm sure it'll have different meanings for different people in our audience. We'll try to design a plan for implementation and compliance, and we'll try to identify challenges and obstacles to implementation. I will try to avoid the use of acronyms in my presentation, or at least define them the first time I use them. So just a 30,000 foot view before we dive in. The revised common rule governs research only funded and supported by DHHS, which means it doesn't cover FDA regulated research. So chances are you do that too. And we'll talk about the implications of that, but it is good news that the 21st Century Cures Act uh, passed, I think a couple years ago now, section 3023, mandates that the DHHS rule and the FDA rule be harmonized no later than three years after the enactment of this act. So even though this rule doesn't apply to FDA regulated research, if things go as planned, it won't be too long before it looks very much like it. It's located in the Federal Register at 45 CFR 46102 through 124. And I have provided a, a text copy of the final rule I also provided you the red line version of that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you might use them in a minute. Since uh, it's good to get a little perspective on how we got to where we are. Uh, if you've been in research for long, you're probably aware that the common rule hasn't been revised since it's been decades. And in the meantime, there've been a lot of developments in the, the research arena. Probably seen yourself the development and widespread use of bio repositories. You've seen that elect, uh, we've gone from written records to EMRs and electronic data, allowing for a lot of large data-driven research. There's also come to be the availability and ease of access to whole genome sequencing and tying that to a lot of disease states and disorders. And then along with this, since we've moved into the digital age, there have been a lot of challenges presented with regard to privacy and confidentiality. And then in the research enterprise itself, there's been a proliferation of collaborative and multi-institutional research. So all of these things kind of put pressure on the OHRP to, to respond to them and to accommodate these in the common rule. Now, along the way, of course, guidance has been provided, but those are recommendations, not regulations. So it really was overdue. In the meantime, too, there's been events that raise controversy in the research enterprise that also affect the regulations. Uh, you may be familiar with The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. Or you can cheat and watch Oprah's series on it. And similar events where people have had their genetic information exploited for commercial purposes. For example, there was a more recent case of Moore versus the Regents of University of California in this case, a cancer patient whose spleen was harvested to produce a cell line that was eventually commercialized by the investigator in UCLA. In the end, Mr. Moore and his family lost a case against those, the investigator and the university. 
when the California Supreme Court determined that individuals have no rights to share in profits earned from commercial products or research derived from their cells. So we'll talk a little bit later about how that impacted the final decisions around identifiable and identifiable and unidentified biospecimens. And of course, you're very familiar with the pretty much weekly news releases on one more data breach of PHI. And that too has forced the OHRP to address confidentiality and privacy of data. 